What's up everyone, Pags here at MEI Studio. This video is going to feature a mic that was mentioned in our AEA video a couple of weeks back. The mic that had started AEA's founder Wes Dooley on his recording journey, the Electrovoice 664. Before we get into the almost 100 year history of EV, give those like and subscribe buttons a press just to check to see if they're still working. In September 1927, Al Kahn and Lou Burroughs started a small radio repair company called Radio Engineers in the basement of a tire factory in South Bend, Indiana. Two years later, the great market crash of 1929 saw the company all but bankrupt and the owners scrambling to get out of the hefty debt they had amassed. They decided to shift the focus of the business to producing audio products to help grow the business. In 1930, they got a call from a college football coach who had fallen ill and was unable to yell his instructions to his players at practice. The coach was looking for an electronic solution to this problem. After consideration, the result was a tower built and situated between four fields, a set of speakers pointing to each field, and a switchable amp that would direct the ailing coach's directions to the field that needed the attention. The school was Notre Dame, and the coach was none other than Newt, win one for the Gipper Rockney. Rockney was impressed by the setup, which he dubbed his Electronic Voice. Al and Lou loved the name and renamed their company Electro Voice soon after. Displeased by the quality and durability of microphones at the time, the pair invested in a metal lathe and drill and began to produce a single mic per week. By 1933, Kahn had made good on all the debts the company had and put Electro Voice in the black and were producing a whole array of audio products. While hiring manufacturing staff, Burroughs returned to the company as chief engineer. When the Second World War broke out, the company provided designs to the War Department to produce noise-canceling audio devices for the troops. A Marine procurement officer called to put in an order for 100,000 units of their mics. At the time, they maybe had 100 in the stockroom. But with a government contract in hand, Electrovoice procured funding and ramped up production to meet the need. After the war, the company moved to Buchanan, Michigan and into a larger facility where they would produce everything from speakers to phonograph cartridges to television antenna boosters and more. In 1952, they patented the compound diffraction horn, which had incredible loudness and was adopted for all sorts of military use, including use on aircraft carriers where the directionality of the speakers was critical in the high noise environment. In 1953, Electrovoice merged with Radio Manufacturing Engineers, or RME, which became the R&D branch for EV. The 1960s saw Electrovoice release their RE line of mics, some of which are still being produced today, like the RE20. By the 1970s, Electrovoice was making loudspeaker arrays and had bought up a little company called Tapco, which was started by a guy by the name of Greg Mackey, who we briefly discussed in our last video about the recording revolution. Tapco was producing mixers, which are a perfect match for EV's PA systems. Electrovoice line arrays could be seen all over the world, including in Yankee Stadium in New York, as well as countless concert venues and festival stages. EV continues to produce top quality products to this day, almost 100 years after their start. Now, back to the subject of today's video. The 664 was released in the mid-1950s as a public address slash ham radio mic. Electrovoice's patent for their variable D design was filed in 1954 and awarded in 1963. The 664 makes use of this, so it's a decent guess that it would be around that time period, as some sources are conflicting on the actual year of release. The 664 is a visual throwback to the 1950s, looking more like a sci-fi movie ray gun or a chrome hood ornament for a car more than a mic. The 664 came in a couple of different colors, a shiny silver, which was the bare pressed zinc body, a golden color, and a dull gray color variant, though all the mics internally were exactly the same. The cardioid capsule was the exclusive Electrovoice Acoust Alloy, which, ironically, is a non-metal diaphragm. The material was resistant to temperature, humidity, shocks, and apparently time as well, since there are an extraordinary number of these mics still working out there. The mic was so rugged, it earned the name the Buchanan Hammer. When demonstrating the mic, Burroughs would sometimes bring wooden nails with him and proceed to hammer a nail into the boards with the mic, then use the mic to prove its durability. Now, I've already hammered a nail into a board with a mic, and I'm not about to do it again with a mic that's potentially near 70 years old. With its widespread use, mics found themselves not only in the hands of ham radio operators and school announcers, but musicians and studios alike. 
Acts such as ZZ Top used modified versions of the mic for videos and live performances, as the aesthetic of the mic was just perfectly and timelessly cool. I've gotten a few requests to talk about the whole variable D technology EV employs on a bunch of their mics. While I wasn't planning on going into it in this video, I was saving it for the RE20 video that's coming up, I'll touch upon it here since the 664 was one of the first mics to employ its use. At its core, Variable D removes or lessens the proximity effect on a directional microphone. Regular dynamic mics that are not omnidirectional exhibit proximity effect, which we looked at in our R88 video, link up top. While this can be a desirable thing for many, there are times where you don't want the mic to muddy up and remain tonally consistent while the mic is being used at different distances and angles. This is especially helpful in broadcast situations where you can dial in a tone if you need to, and not have to worry about someone getting too close to the mic and having the proximity effect wind up clipping the preamp. While variable D doesn't solve the amplitude effects of moving around the mic, which is the volume, it does stop the frequency shift from happening, which leads to a more consistent sound overall. Again, I'm going to go into this in more detail in the upcoming RE20 video, and we'll make a comparison of a couple of different broadcast standard mics on this topic. So, what is this mic good for in the studio? Well, I'll be honest, I've only had one as a display piece and I've never used it in the studio. I wasn't even entirely sure the one I have even worked before this video. Because the connector that mates with this mic can retail for over 100 USD, which is more than I paid for the mic, I had been reluctant to even pick up the part to make the cable to use it. I was able to procure one for a fraction of the normal cost through a generous internet person so I could do this video, but me being the tinkerer thought, why can't I just do some kind of non-destructive mod to the mic to allow it to use an XLR connector instead? And so I did. And now I have a very expensive, rare mic cable connector that I don't need, and a mic that I can use with a standard XLR cable. I took measurements of the connector housing and realized that a standard XLR connector could fit in there with room to spare. However, the set screw that the original connector used was kind of far up into the body to be useful for an XLR. So I designed this. The XLR fits into the end and the set screw locks the pin assembly into place. The set screw on the outside of the body can either be left out entirely or screwed through the grounding tab on the pin assembly. The notch fits the notch in the mic and keeps it snug and properly oriented. If you could use one of these, stay tuned, I'll show you where you can get it after the demo. First, let's take a listen to it on vocals. I'm not too optimistic about the sound as the frequency response chart leads me to believe this mic is going to be very upper mid heavy and the variable D design is going to wind up staving off most of the proximity effect and the bottom end doesn't look too promising. That's always a letdown. But we'll give it a go anyway. And then I'm thinking let's try it on an electric guitar and perhaps a snare drum as well since there's a nice bump at around 3k. Let's get to the demo. This is the Electrovoy 664 Dynamic Cardioid Microphone. Zero degrees on axis. 90 degrees off axis. 180 degrees off axis. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Simple Simon said something stupid. Simple Simon said something stupid. The Electrovoice 664 Dynamic Microphone. The Electrovoice 664 Dynamic Microphone. The Electrovoice 664 Dynamic Microphone.
Well, that actually wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be, honestly. A note to anyone that's looking to buy one of these mics. First, make sure there's a cable. Doesn't matter which, the high or low Z cable. It's really easy to change the impedance at the cable. But do make sure that a cable is included with the mic, unless you want to spend another 60 to 120 USD on getting this thing able to plug in using a homemade or pre-made cable. If you have access to a 3D printer, I've left a link to my Thingiverse page where you can download the STL file for the XLR mod I came up with that fits into the end of this mic. Also some things to note, there were at least three variants of the mic that I've seen. The first has the three ports near the end of the mic and the round backside, and who doesn't love a nice round backside? These appear to be the first generation. The second generation has a single port and a more normalized backside without the hump, but the stand and jack area are still kind of rounded off. The last has a very square stand and jack section, and the body of the mic is quite different as well, as they don't have that cool fin running along the top. These are the 664A variants. I've seen a version that was kind of a combo between the first and the second generation on eBay, but that might have been somebody's Frankenstein project and not an actual released version. Since these mics are so old, it's really anyone's guess as to what the working condition is, unless you're able to try before you buy. The one I have here is kind of thin sounding, but again, it's a PA slash ham mic and it's kind of expected. Besides the visual coolness factor, did this mic do anything for you? Did it have some kind of mojo that you were digging? Should I mod mine like ZZ Top and throw in a nice condenser capsule into it? Do you randomly think about the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters and what the cleanup effort was like after he exploded? Let's discuss in the comments. If you've gotten anything from today's video, please hit that like and subscribe button. It'll really help us out. If you're interested in studio mics and other things audio related, hit that notify button so you'll be notified when we put up a new video. Well, that's it for this time. This is Pags, signing off.